Hello everyone, I'm Robin and I'm very happy to be speaking with you today. I'm from the chair of for distributed information systems of Friedrich Schiller University Jena and today I will present our work on data augmentation for named entity recognition that was carried out in collaboration with the computer linguistics chair of Bielefeld University. As this is a recording, I would be happy to answer your questions at the end of the presentation. I will start with the context of this paper and some background information on the area, explaining the two key concepts that also appear in the title, named entity recognition and data augmentation. In the course of explaining these, I will also motivate our work. Uh, after that, I briefly introduce the approach we chose and provide a closer look at the techniques we implemented and evaluated. And finally, we will go through our experiment setup, the evaluation conclusion and potential future work. Okay, so we worked in this paper in the course of the Canarino project of the Fusion Work Group. Generally, in Germany, public authorities have to follow a specific process in order to provide an administrative service. And due to new legislation, these services will also have to be offered digitally from the next year on. In order to digitize the processes, they have to be modeled, which requires the analysis of the legal basis in which the processes are outlined. Uh, now, the overall objective of the Canarino project is to support this legal norm analysis by essentially detecting relevant object, objects in the text. One of the challenges of the project is that no named entity recognition dataset with data from German legal norms and with the same semantic categories that the project requires exists right now. So such a corpus will have to be created and to get the most out of it, it would be nice if data augmentation could be applied to further increase the corpus size and improve the model performance. So in this work, we tested how well selected data augmentation methods work with similar data from the German legal domain. First of all, I will explain what named entity recognition is. Named entity recognition belongs to the field of natural language processing and is often defined as the task of detecting and classifying named entities in text, as you can see on the slide. From the figure, you can also see that named entities in this case can be understood as some predefined semantic classes. A growing number of other applications such as question answering, machine translation and knowledge based construction rely on named entity recognition. And therefore, it's considered a valuable tool for information extraction. The named entity recognition task is usually solved by supervised machine learning models. As most of you probably know, supervised machine learning models require a large amount of training data. This data has to be of high quality, as diverse as possible, and also represent the data that the system will encounter during its application. Supplying models with more such training data improves overall performance and generalization capabilities of the model. Acquiring this training data is expensive because the annotation could involve domain experts and is a time-consuming process. Therefore, there is a constant need for more annotated data, especially domain-specific data. One solution to this problem is generating more new training data automatically. This method, called data augmentation, has its origins in the computer vision domain, where existing training images will be, for example, rotated, cropped or scaled to generate new training images. As you can see here with the cute picture of my cat, data augmentation works by essentially adding slightly modified copies of existing data to the dataset, increasing the total amount of data. And of course, this can also be done for textual data. Also, there are already numerous other works evaluating different data augmentation techniques for natural language processing data. We found that none uses data from the legal domain and all of them mainly consider English data. None directly compares different sources that can be used with synonym replacement. And lastly, other implementations of back translation only perform segment-wise back translation, excluding entities, limiting the degree of change that might be achieved or rely on a named entity recognition model to re-annotate the back translated sentences. Our goal is to evaluate and compare different uh, data augmentation techniques for the named entity recognition task, explicitly focusing on the German legal domain and thus using the German legal entity recognition dataset. The key contributions of this paper are first to propose a workflow for the generation and augmentation of different data set fractions using three different data augmentation techniques along with three different synonym sources. Second, to introduce a back translation method that does not rely on pre-trained models for translation or re-annotation and translates the whole sentence including entities and thereby enriches dimension space. And of course the evaluation and comparison of the effectiveness of the selected data augmentation approaches 
using two deep learning models on a German legal data set. Now we come to this section uh, which covers our approach. The training and evaluation workflow is illustrated in this diagram. We first took the train split of the German legal entity recognition dataset and then took a fraction of the train split containing either 1%, 10%, 30%, 50% or 100% of all sentences. For setting the baseline, we of course skipped the augmentation step of the dataset fraction and for testing the effect of the different data augmentation techniques, we applied the technique in this step. And finally, we trained both models on the fraction and evaluated the model performance on the test split. As a main metric during evaluation, we decided to use the micro F1 score. Next up, I will present the three data augmentation techniques that we chose to implement, starting with synonym replacement. The idea of synonym replacement is to replace some tokens in a sentence with other tokens that are similar in meaning to the original tokens. That way, the original labels of the sentence still remain valid and we get a new additional training sentence. These replacement tokens can come from different sources, as illustrated in the slide, resulting in different replacements. The percentage of replaced tokens as well as the source are parameters that can be changed. Let's have a look at how this works in detail. Uh, this sentence will be our running example for the process and during the next slides we will create a modified copy of it. You can see the index of the token and the annotated uh, label in the table. First of all, we want to find out which tokens are eligible for replacement. We exclude all tokens that belong to an entity, highlighted in red. And we also exclude all tokens, um, now highlighted in red as well, that don't match the regular expression you can see on the slide. This excludes tokens that don't exclusively consist of groups of letters, assuring that we don't try to replace, for example, punctuation marks. From the remaining tokens, we take the desired percentage, in this case 40%, and randomly select, in this case, two tokens which will be replaced. In this example, uh, we will be replacing D and Kostenentscheidung. We then query the selected replacement source with the original token in order to get a list of possible replacements. We filter this list with the same regular expression again and then replace the token with the highest rank remaining token. We do this filtering here because some sources try to insert, for example, punctuation into the middle of a sentence, uh, which we don't want to have. In this case, none of the candidates gets filtered out, so Nebenentscheidung is the final replacement. For the next token, uh, the procedure is the same, except that this time the replacement source returned dot .d as replacement, which does not pass the filter. The next best replacement is eine, so we, we uh, replace the token with it. And now, this is already the final sentence. Um, synonym replacement can take between 0.1 and 12 seconds per sentence, depending on uh, length, replacement percentage, and replacement source. The second technique is called mention replacement and is somewhat similar to synonym replacement, except that instead of the non-mentions, the mentions are replaced. The replacements are random entities of the same semantic class from the training split of the dataset, and uh, we always replace all mentions in a sentence. Uh, and uh, maybe to prevent some confusion, I have to add that the terms mention and entity can be used interchangeably when talking about named entity recognition. Again, we have a sentence and during the next slides we will create a modified copy of it. Uh, this sentence that I chose as an example contains two entities highlighted in blue, which will both be replaced. First, we extract the entity information from the sentence, including their start index and class. We then start and retrieve a replacement for the first entity from the dictionary. We tokenize this replacement and insert it in place of the old entity. Then we repeat the process for the other entity. But before we do that, we have to update the information that we stored about the positions of the entities earlier, because the replacement entity is a bit longer than the original entity. This offset can be calculated by subtracting the length of the original token from the length of the replacement token. In this case, the offset is 1. After doing that, the replacement for the other entity can be retrieved, tokenized and inserted in place of the original entity, resulting in this final sentence. This data augmentation technique is the fastest and simplest of all three. It only takes about 0.01 seconds per sentence, much less than synonym replacement. Uh, the third and last technique, back translation, is a bit different from the other two. 
Here we translate a sentence to a so-called pivotal language and then back to the original language. The reason for this is that we hope that this introduces changes in the sentence, not only superficial changes like replacing words with their synonyms, but also changes in sentence structure. Uh, the setup is similar to the other examples. We will now shortly go through the process of creating a modified copy of this sentence. First, we extract all entities and their class from this sentence. In this case, it contains only one entity. We then back translate the entity, meaning that we first translate it to English and then back to German. This results in this plain string highlighted in yellow. You can see that it changed compared to the original string. We keep both versions, so to speak, of the entity for later. Next, the entire sentence is back translated by um, translating it to English and back to German. The resulting string is tokenized and basically already the modified copy of the original sentence. It's only missing one thing, that is the annotations which tell me which parts of the sentence belong to which semantic class. And of course, we need this if we want to use the sentence for training. As we expect the translation to preserve the entities in the sentence, we can now make use of the information we collected earlier and try to re-annotate the back translated sentence. To do that, we tokenize the original and the back translated version of the entity and try to match it with parts of the back translated sentence. In this case, we cannot find the original entity, but the back translated version. And this already is the generated modified copy of the original sentence. Applying back translation takes about 12 seconds per sentence due to limits of the used translation service. In this next section, I will briefly introduce our setup, the dataset, as well as the models that we worked with and present the key findings of our evaluation. The environment we were working in was running Python 3.912 and a variety of Python libraries, such as the popular Transformers library, the Flare framework and fast text embeddings. All evaluations were run on a single NVIDIA A100 GPU. And um, the dataset we chose to work with, as I already mentioned earlier, is the German Legal Entity Recognition dataset, which was created and published two years ago by Leitner AI. On the right side of the slide, you can see some annotated parts of the dataset. It contains uh, 67,000 sentences with over 2 million tokens, which are classified into 19 different classes. As I already mentioned earlier, we evaluated the effect of applying of um, applying data augmentation to the data with two different common deep learning models. One of the models is a bidirectional long short-term memory network, which is very popular in natural language processing applications. It's frequently combined with a conditional random field layer that is added on top, which acts as the tag decoder. In order for the neural network to be able to process text as input, it's common to use so-called embeddings. We decided to use the German Flare embeddings and the German Fast Text embeddings combined. From now on, I will refer to this model as the BioLSTM CRF model. Uh, the other model we decided to use is a transformer model. In contrast to regular recurrent neural networks, transformer models process input sequences all at once. Transformers, as you maybe already know, can be pre-trained on large amounts of data to develop an accurate inner representation of one or multiple languages. Such a pre-trained transformer-based language model can then be fine-tuned relatively easily to solve other tasks like sentiment analysis, question answering, and named entity recognition, which we are interested in. The chosen transformer, XLM Roberta, is similar to the well-known BERT transformer. From now on, I will refer to this model as the XLMR model. Let's now turn to our results. Uh, during the evaluation, we learned that in very low data settings, uh, by LSTM CRF outperforms the XLMR model. For all other dataset fractions, the XLMR model outperforms the by LSTM CRF model. In most cases, the application of synonym replacement led to performance improvements. We also found that the contextual language model as source is best used with a low replacement percentage. For the other sources, we get mixed results. By applying mention replacement, we only achieved significant improvements with the smaller 1% and 10% datasets with the biggest relative improvements for the smallest data set. Our novel back translation technique did not have a significant impact, neither positive nor negative, on the performance of either model. We believe that it is challenged by the long and nested sentences, occasional ambiguities, and frequently occurring legal concepts 
that do not, do not exist in the country's legal system of the used pivotal language. In this plot, you can uh, nicely see what I just talked about. It uh, shows the average micro F1 score improvements across all data sets achieved by applying synonym replacement with different replacement sources, replacement percentages, and the two models. Uh, first, the contextual language model, abbreviated with CLM on the plot, as replacement source works best when combined with a low replacement percentage, which is the red bar. And uh, second, that the XLMR model benefits more from applying data augmentation techniques than the BioLSTM CRF model. Uh, as you can see, the bars are higher on that side of the plot. Um, this brings me to the end of my presentation. And in this work, we implemented three different data augmentation techniques uh, for use with named entity recognition training data, evaluated them on data from the German legal domain and compared different German replacement sources and percentages for synonym replacement. We believe that the proposed implementation of back translation is unique in its ability to back translate entire sentences by preserving the labels. From this, uh, we learned that data augmentation can be beneficial when working with small data sets, that mention and synonym replacement deliver comparable results, that mention replacement is the most efficient technique with respect to computational complexity and the resulting improvement, and that for synonym replacement, the contextual language model is the most effective source. Future work could focus on improving the back translation technique by adding fuzzy matching of entities during re-annotation or extending uh, mention replacement to gather entities from a knowledge base, which would introduce new entities. And finally, synonym replacement could benefit from a mechanism that prevents the replacements from being too similar to the original token, for example, um, by requiring a minimum added distance. And that's it from my part. Um, here you can see a link to the GitHub repos repository that contains the source code, as well as the links to Zenodo with the resulting data sets and the detailed evaluation results. Next to that, there is a link to the working group Open Design of Digital Administrative Architectures, which was responsible for the Canalino project. And finally, next to that, there is a link to the website of our group, the Fusion Group at the University of Vienna. Thank you for your attention. I hope you found this presentation useful and um, I would be happy to, happy to answer your questions now.